Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm very honored today. Um, I get to introduce this morning's keynote speaker, Mr. James Daunt. Um, Mr. Daunt has over 30 years experience in book selling. In 1990, after an early career as an investment banker, Mr. Daunt opened his own bookstore in London called Daunt Books. Daunt Books now has nine locations, mainly in London, and remains independently owned by Mr. Daunt. Uh, he does this in addition to his role as the Chief Executive Officer of Barnes & Noble, the world's largest retail bookseller. His purview includes paper source and waterstones. Mr. Daunt currently oversees approximately 600 Barnes & Noble bookstores, 125 paper source locations, and over 300 bookshops across the UK, Ireland, the Netherlands, and Belgium. This includes Waterstones, Blackwells, Foils, and Hatchards. But wait, there is more. Um, besides his successes in book selling, which are significant, um, Mr. Daunt was elected as an honorary fellow of the Royal Society of Literature in 2017 and appointed a commander of the Order of the British Empire and the 2022 Queen's Birthday Honours for service to the publishing industry. We're so delighted to have him here with us in Charleston. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Daunt. Thank you, Courtney, and, and thank you, Katina, for inviting me uh, here. It is really a huge honor um, to be in a room um, with, above all, so many librarians. Um, I think that the title um, up, up on the screen behind me is, is to sort of think about the ways in which um, bookstores and libraries um, uh, share, I think, considerable um, vocational uh, similarities. Um, we're not the same. Um, uh, without any equivocation or doubt, libraries are vastly the more superior to bookstores. Um, you, those of you who are libraries and I, librarians, and I know we have plenty of publishers and others within the wider book world here, um, but we all of us um, are in a pecking order sitting behind libraries as the place that encourages learning, uh, where I think probably all of us first uh, encountered uh, truly on, for our own selves uh, what it is to read and to learn. Um, and then, of course, libraries in our college years, those of us who are lucky enough to have gone to university, it is the library that probably remains as the sort of the, one of the core central uh, parts of our lives. Um, I have to say on a personal note, um, it's been sort of thrilling for me that now my own children, uh, as they've gone to college, um, what they've uh, focused on is their libraries. If you have a good library, you have a, a, a truly a place in which to engage and to learn, um, and actually also a, a social space, which I think sort of come, brings me to where I see um, our, our own uh, endeavors, um, in my case first in my own stores, uh, then at Waterstones, which is the sort of Barnes & Noble equivalent in the United Kingdom, and now here in the United States with Barnes & Noble. Um, what is it to uh, run a good bookstore? Uh, what is it that one is uh, seeking to do? Um, and unfortunately, um, in, in each of the cases in coming to Waterstones and now coming to Barnes & Noble, that was a question that needed rather urgently to be answered because the businesses themselves were failing. Um, we had lost sight um, of the purpose, I think, of, of what it was to be a bookseller. Um, and in doing so, uh, had lost our customer base. Uh, sales declining every year, number of stores declining every year, the business uh, heading, unfortunately and remorselessly, uh, to, to uh, closure, which has been the fate of most of the chain booksellers uh, worldwide, um, and which left, um, and I think much to the detriment of society as a whole, left in the United Kingdom only one single large bookseller and effectively also in the United States only one large uh, retail bookseller. Most communities, uh, therefore, if they're lucky enough to have an independent, of course, wonderful, um, but that the independents are small in number and small in size, um, you rely on the big box guys, uh, which is now really only Barnes & Noble, to provide large, democratically welcoming spaces 
Uh, everybody can come into a Barnes & Noble. They're huge. The kids, as they leave school, um, they are a safe space. Uh, they're a third space. They are a, a space in which, by the nature of what we do, uh, selling books, um, surrounded by books, the atmosphere of a, a place in which ideas and learning uh, is available to anybody who comes in, they're important. Um, unfortunately, we weren't running them well enough, they weren't compelling enough, they weren't interesting enough. Um, and that uh, needed to be addressed if there was going to be a future for large uh, chain book selling in the United States, um, as previously uh, we'd had to do in the United Kingdom. And really, I think what we've addressed um, is, is probably the four key things. Um, uh, in no particular order, um, we needed to engage with our people um, and uh, ensure that the people working in our stores, our booksellers, uh, were invested uh, in the business, uh, that we were appealing to the vocational um, and true to the vocational part of why it is that one is a bookseller, uh, rather than, as unfortunately had increasingly become the case, uh, treating this as any other retail business in which we have retail lit workforce, part-time, poorly paid, uh, expected to uh, work through the, the rote uh, uh, operational um, uh, necessities of of, of day-to-day -day retailing. Uh, book selling is not that. Book selling is about how you create and how you engage and how you communicate and how you create the atmosphere uh, that that allows one to deliver a great bookstore, and that is based on people. Um, as I wander through these things, I suppose what I'm I'm really going to be wrapping up to say um, is that um, I think some of these things perhaps also um, will resonate to librarians um, because libraries also have a social. A play, uh, are safe spaces and places of learning and places of uh, meeting, as well as purely being places in which one finds books. So for us, it was about our people, um, and that is an ongoing exercise. How do we uh, train them? How do we empower them? Um, we do so, um, above all, I think, by trusting them, uh, decentralizing in our case, no longer trying to direct uh, only from the center, uh, really uh, relying on them, uh, to do the best uh, that they can in their stores. Uh, as one does this, um, we find in, in all reality that um, a significant number uh, become very much better very quickly. Um, and that's been the case, happy case at Barnes & Noble. Uh, it's also a, a simple um, observable fact that many get worse. Um, and I think one of the most important things that we do as we lead our people is to tolerate uh, failure, uh, to understand that people need to experiment, need to uh, uh, go with the good as well as the bad. Uh, and our job is to, in an understanding and kind way, sweep up um, those who are not doing so well, um, partner them particularly locally with people who are doing well, and thereby bring forward um, the, the bookstores as a whole. Uh, the endeavor in which they're engaged is about, uh, I think about the books, of course, um, the range, what, I, the, what books you have on your shelves, particularly through your deep uh, backlist sections um, through the store. That is something that has been done historically rather passively. We just take in the books from the publishers. Uh, the books that exist in our stores are really a, a matter of accident to a considerable degree. We just fill them up. Um, that uh, we are now steadily changing um, and uh, working through trying to identify and, and uh, uh, frankly uh, eliminate from our shelves the books that shouldn't be there, uh, books either because they're out of date, because they're boring, because there are better editions, uh, and then also bring in the books that are missing. Uh, overall, that's seen us steadily increase uh, the number of titles that we have in our, our stores, increasing the range. Um, quite materially, probably a third more individual titles within our stores. But in doing that, we're also uh, removing a lot. It's about improving uh, the range. The third part of it is not just having good range in our stores, uh, good title selection, but how you curate them, how you present them, and how you organize them. Um, bookstores have been notoriously bad at uh, doing this. Uh, we're very good at um, anything that can be sensibly arranged A to Z. Uh, fiction, obviously, does that very nicely, and all the branches of fiction uh, will arrange A to Z uh, perfectly well. Non-fiction does not work in that way. Unfortunately, we had uh, found it much easier to arrange A to Z, um, and 
working now with our booksellers to understand that you have to think through how you're arranging, particularly your non-fiction section, is a major challenge for us. Uh, to take the most simple of all examples, history. Um, uh, we were split between US history and world history. Each of those was A to Z by author. That is not a very uh, engaging, intelligent, or uh, uh, interactive way of organizing your shelves. You need to do it chronologically, quite obviously, and in the case of world history, uh, arranging it by country and then chronologically within each country. Um, unfortunately, as you do that, suddenly your store becomes very, very much worse. And the reason it becomes worse is that it suddenly lays bare what you actually have. Um, when it's all A to Z, you have no idea whether you've got any books on the French Revolution. You can go hunting through the shelves and maybe under S for Charme, you find a book on citizens on the French Revolution and whoopee, you've got one. Uh, but it's only when you bring them all together uh, that you suddenly decide that's all you have. You have nothing else. That you have great voids. Um, and also that you're hugely over-assorted um, in, in some areas. Some of that, of course, is, is cultural. And um, one, of, one of the curiosities, for example, is as we've done this, we found that in most of our stores, we had probably about 10 bays. Um, uh, that's six shelves to every bay. That's a lot of books on the Second World War. Um, many stores had one, two, or three books on the First World War. It's a curiosity. Um, something sort of cultural in terms of the importance with which the two uh, events are considered within, within American teaching. And, and, but nonetheless, that is an imbalance which makes absolutely no sense at all. So we are um, now engaged in curation. Um, and it's uh, the, the secondary part and the important uh, uh, twin to uh, working through the range that we carry. And the last and, and the fourth part of what we're trying to do is, is really address what I call atmosphere, um, and it's uh, uh, that function of, of presentation of visual merchandising standards is a function of um, some sort of basic things of investment in our stores, the lighting, the carpets, uh, the furniture. Um, we were, in, in retrospect, the one sort of really clever thing we did was during COVID, when we were closed, as we were in most of the country, uh, we kept our booksellers employed and we kept them in the buildings working. Uh, rearranging our stores, and they uh, pulled uh, the what was a conventional uh, linear structure of shelving um, and rearranged those into what we call rooms. Uh, there was basic guidance given, but they were really asked to get on with it. Um, what that really does is is change the way, the way in which you experience a bookstore and the way in which you browse a bookstore. Um, we got a lot further to go on this. Um, and I think um, what, we're, what we're constantly doing here is reinforcing the bookstore as a place in which it is pleasant and enjoyable and fun uh, and engaging to be. Um, I do not um, have academic bookstores here uh, in the United States. Barnes & Noble um, Education is a separate company altogether. Uh, but I do in the United Kingdom, uh, where we in particular own Blackwells, which is, uh, owns Heifers and, and a number of the other uh, academic university-based um, stores. Uh, that is a business that in the United Kingdom we are having big trouble with uh, declining book sales, declining um, uh, college uh, student uh, buying of books and, and the cost of the books going up. So the, the bookseller gets really squeezed in that space. What we found though has been hugely successful for us is um, both changing what we have in our stores, making them broader, uh, making them uh, all, all of what I've been talking about in terms of people, books, curation. Uh, but mainly it's been about changing what we are as a social space. So putting in lots and lots of nooks and crannies in which people can sit, uh, plug in their laptops and students can be, um, making our cafes much more engaging, making it a place in which um, students will just come and um, frankly bury themselves away. When you have a building full of kids, um, the business follows quite quickly thereafter. And not necessarily selling anything to those kids, but it, they become hubs and social spaces. And I think all of us, as we engage with books and how we are to marry um, our, uh, in our case, our customers, um, but also our communities with books, it is so much around creating welcoming, safe, uh, enjoyable spaces. Uh, in our case, that uh, turned out to be, above all, providing them with good Wi-Fi 
um, and a plug. Uh, then we were done. Um, the key sort of central uh, tenant that we have as, as a bookseller, both at, at Barnes and Noble um, and, and previously at Waterstones, has been that the book is our future, that the physical book is not going away, uh, that there are unique and wonderful things uh, that are attributable to the physical book. Uh, at the same time that we have nothing to fear of E, reading, of Kindle, of Nook, um, that that is a partner. Um, and this follows a, a true belief, uh, certainly on my part, and one that I, I campaigned and continue to campaign for, that also we have nothing to fear of Amazon. There are many, many, many ways in which one can buy a book, um, uh, and a, a bookstore is just one of them. Um, in our case, and this is a, a slight irony as I address this room, but I've always, to my booksellers, said, you know, for goodness sake, guys, just think where you first encountered books, where you've got most of your books. And that place for all of us is the library. And those guys give them away for free. So why on earth are we worried about Amazon? Amazon makes people pay for books. And I think what, what I really mean by all of that is that it's the physical book matters. And then for us, it's in many ways, it is, well, OK, how are you going to engage with that physical book? And each individual will have probably different uh, routes to books at different times, and we'll get different forms of enjoyment from it. The problem with the library is, yes, they give it for you free, but you have to give it back. That's not so good. Um, the trouble with Amazon is, yes, it's extremely functional, and actually you save a bit of money as well. But there's no emotion attached to the buying process. You're sitting there clicking away on a screen, on your phone, on your tablet, whatever it might be, and then it pops in a sort of rather dismal way through to your house, and you open up a, you know, unattractive envelope. There's no ceremony around that. There is nothing compared to the enjoyment you get when you're in a bookstore, and you pick up a book, and you take it to a register, and you're walking out with a book. The enjoyment and the great pleasure you get. And let's face it, most of us have invested such uh, emotional attachment at that point, we can almost convince ourselves we've read it. Um, you, you don't do that when you've, you've just opened the envelope. So for me, Amazon really is something that is there, uh, perhaps even as a helpful um, further tool to democratize the ownership of books. It makes it easy, it makes it uh, functional. They've done us a massive service because we no longer have to carry boring books. Um, we, we, we really used to have lots and lots of our store given over to uh, the dull, the technical, um, and uh, now if you need those books, and you only buy those books if you need them, you just go on Amazon and get them, and we no longer have to have them in our stores, which has liberated ourselves uh, to expand what we do uh, want to do that's interesting, um, and uh, also given us the space to uh, curate to present better, to uh, have more books face out, have more tables, to, to, to really celebrate the physical object of the book. And I think the E and Kindle reading is, is the same. It's, um, it's very effective, obviously, in some circumstances. It keeps people connected to books. Um, it's meant that we've, you know, some of the genre publishing has, has been able to be de-emphasized in our stores because so many people who are reading two, three books uh, a week more, uh, again, to do so on their Kindles because it's so much cheaper and so much easier. Um, and audio, again, is another um, uh, celebration for us because it's keeping people engaged with literature, with ideas, uh, with thought. Uh, and whether they're doing so listening to books or um, on, on their various podcasts of any sort, all of that uh, engagement with knowledge and with learning will eventually bring you back to books. Uh, and generally, if you are a reader, you'll end up in a bookstore at some point. Now, of course, um, we are not in, in uh, wholly easy times, um, and I think... Uh, all of us, both uh, booksellers and librarians, are uh, acutely aware of, of both political and social changes and the pressures that comes with that. I would expect that quite a lot of your uh, discussions at this conference have involved book banning and the pressures there and how do you respond uh, to, to those. I 
in a sense, find that the book banning side of things uh, relatively straightforward. We fight it, um, and it is clearly in view. And you do it in front of judges, and you do it in courts, and you do it uh, in every way and with the de every uh, level of determination you can. It's in plain sight. What's not in plain sight are the social pressures that are also uh, upon us all, which are much more individual. Uh, they're individual within communities, uh, to individual stores, as well as collectively. Uh, groups of people who uh, object to us selling one sort of a book or another sort of a book. Um, it's happening in the United Kingdom, it's happening in the United States, um, and we, we feel it um, uh, quite acutely uh, and, and quite very unpleasantly, uh, both uh, at, at a corporate level and uh, in the individual stores. Again, I think that's something that we have to, all of us, resolutely stand. Um, and it is making a stand around where is the line um, for uh, free speech, uh, for being open to all ideas, but also saying, where is uh, the, where is the a line to be drawn? Um, at Barnes and Noble, um, certainly under my leadership, we ha we do draw a line. Um, we have a clear line drawn around what I call public decency. Um, and if if books are uh, pornographic or unpleasant in one way, we do not have them in our stores. We do not. We're not obliged. We believe to carry them. If books are incite racism, hatred. Uh, anti-Semitism, whatever it might be, equally we can draw a line. Now, that is obviously uh, subject to uh, interpretation. Um, there will always be an area in which you are um, making a judgment which is can be um, uh, relatively nuanced, but I think that I feel wholly comfortable in doing as a bookseller. Um, and doing so as a proponent of free speech and, and as a proponent for inclusion and also unashamedly as a proponent for all of the civilizing aspects of what our profession brings. We are a place that is open to all, uh, open to all ideas and which encourages positive uh, uh, aspects of kindness and cooperation and community. Um, that is essentially why most of us, um, I think, want to be booksellers, and I'm sure that's a huge part of what it is also to be a librarian. As we um, sort of look into the crystal ball, um, uh, thinking about the future, um, we as booksellers, I think, are, are now feeling hugely optimistic. Um, we know that as we've brought our stores back to focus on books, that they've become much busier. Um, uh, the sales are going up, which means profits are going up. Um, profits, um, of course, um, please our owners. Um, our owners are a private equity firm, so profits are very uh, uh, much in their mind's eye. Uh, but for us, what that means is that we can uh, invest, uh, invest in new stores, uh, importantly, uh, if you can grow, you can provide career opportunities um, and also bring stores to more communities. Um, it means that you can, as old stores uh, get moved, get redeveloped, that we can relocate and keep the jobs and the presence in communities. A business that had gone from sort of 900 stores down to 600 stores um, is now growing back again. And we see every prospect in three, four years' time to be back up at at, at those high levels, and that is bringing bookstores back into communities that have been deprived them. Um, equally, uh, investing in uh, the appearance of our stores um, and crucially, investing in our people, um, making uh, the, the profession of a bookseller a truly a career one. Um, uh, we have to improve pay, we have to have a career structure which people can see proper prospects uh, and see that uh, they can spend their lives uh, usefully uh, uh, employed in a way that allows them to both enjoy the pro professional satisfaction that comes from a great, great uh, 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 profession wrapped around books and learning and serving within a community, but also gives them the material rewards that we all of us have every right to expect. Um, I, I'm sure in terms of all of the funding decisions that go on within libraries, um, that whilst yours are not driven by profit, uh, it is driven by funding, uh, which is essentially there. Now, I have gone to half past, which is what I think I was asked to do. 
um, and um, and will be very very uh, uh, willing to answer any and all questions that, that you have from the floor. Um, and I presume there may be a raving mic. Yes, please, um, if you would mind queuing behind uh, the microphones here, um, please begin by stating your name and affiliation, um, and we have plenty of time for questions. Hi, I'm Julia Rodriguez from Oakland University in sunny Michigan. Um, I just want to say that my children were very upset when our local Barnes & Nobles closed because of redevelopment, not because it wasn't loved. Um, but I'm hoping it'll come back. My question is about, uh, you kind of touched a little bit, but is about DEI efforts, both corporately but also locally, to help diversify the voices that are being presented. Um, during COVID, I tried to... Uh, I had a lot more time, so I decided to read just women of color. And I was able to get, I was surprised I was able to get a number of books from Barnes and Nobles, but a lot of them I had to order. So I'm just curious if you'd talk a little bit about that. I think that's um, a, a, an interesting question, which is both one that we need to address in terms of the range that we carry and, and whether we've uh, reviewed and, and ensured that we're including everything, but also, a question that, that needs to be asked quite sort of closely of publishers as well, because of the amount and, and focus of publishing, particularly uh, from the major publishers. I mean, we are, as a bookseller, um, focused on the mainstream <coughs> publishing industry. Um, we uh, get 80-ish percent of our books from uh, the major recognized publishers. Um, that is probably no more than 20. Uh, publishing houses. Um, you don't have to go much further down that to, to gobble up the rest. Uh, within that, the range of publishing is, is relatively narrow, and I would say from a diversity perspective, probably can be improved fairly significantly. We have also uh, now completely decentralized um, the reordering of books. Um, so every store now uh, is accountable for what it has and what it reorders. We still centrally order new books, um, generally a single copy. Um, and then it's up to the stores as to whether they order more um, uh, and whether when they sell them, they keep them. Um, and we also in the, the world of, of book selling, we can return books that haven't sold or we don't wish to have. I, I think it's two things uh, in answer to that. I think it's one, it's about range, but it's actually also significantly about how you bring those books together and how you present them and how you celebrate them. Um, the decentralization has meant now that we have very, very different stores um, and uh, it is very noticeable how brilliantly, um, particularly in some communities, they are addressing the, the, the very aspects that you have. Our job now is to say, well, how do you where you see people doing it well, how do you communicate um, the examples of good so that other stores can copy them? And how do you do it in a way that isn't prescriptive? Because that would completely undermine what we are trying to do, which is in terms of give local accountability. But we are increasingly using the best amongst our booksellers to educate the, the less uh, uh, good. Um, and it's an open door with our booksellers in terms of really addressing these issues and, and um, and I think it's one of the things that we're beginning to do better and better. Um, selling books in other languages, though, is something that we struggle with. We do Spanish relatively well, and we're putting a huge effort into it, but we don't do any other languages. And that's something that we are scratching our head about, um, needing to find amongst our book selling population people who understand uh, other foreign language publishing and how we could and should develop within, particularly within communities where there is the demand, uh, something beyond English and Spanish. Um, thank you for your talk. So I'm Robert Harrington, and I'm at the American Mathematical Society. And we publish around 80, 85 books a year, and we actually have our own print shop, believe it or not, where we still guillotine the books and everything. But my question really relates to um, my history in the sense that when I was growing up, I used to spend a lot of time in your Marlebone High Street daunts 
book shot. And what I loved about that is the way that everything was sort of categorized by country and you could browse. There's a sense of discovery and browse, um, not necessarily for math books really, but, but general, <laughs> more general in travel and fiction and so on. And my question to you is, in the sort of the era of the discovery and internet browsing and, and sort of happenstance, can you export that concept that you've done in, with Daunts to a more general bookstore audience and even to libraries? Is that a place where you can encourage physical browse? I, I think it is, and thank you for the kind words on, on, on my own um, bookshop, which is where my heart truly resides. Um, I think it is that it is this element of curation that is so vital to making a bookstore engaging. Um, so it is, you, you have to have the right books in there, but it's really about how you organize and present them. Uh, and I do not believe that there should be a prescriptive rule. Now, of course, I've inherited um, businesses where they're very prescriptive. Um, and they even have a machine which you zip the barcode on uh, the EAN on, on the book and it tells you where to put it. And that's idiotic beyond belief. <laughs> um, but we still do it. What we're now trying to do is encourage people to think about how you should best organize your books. And there is no right way. Uh, the way I do it in my own bookstores is, as has just been said, is, is completely bonkers, actually. It is by country, uh, by which I mean I take every sort of book and endeavor to say, well, to which country does it belong? A history, that's relatively easy. When you get to fiction, it's, you know, generally it's easy, but what happens if it moves country and what do you do and uh, cookery and anthropology and travel and so on? And, and, what, what the reason I did that was I was opening an independent bookstore when in, at a time when there were lots of chain booksellers. Uh, there was Waterson's and Dillon's and lots and lots of others, most of which had gone bankrupt. Uh, but I needed to be distinctive. It also happened to be how I actually read and become interested in a place, and then I want to read everything about it. Um, what I'm encouraging at, uh, at Barnes & Noble now is for each of the stores to really think about how they want to present their store. Uh, and it should be driven uh, by, obviously, by the community, uh, what the interests are, but also by the physical geography of the store. If you're a, a single floor, that's different to being two floors. Uh, if you've got nooks and crannies, what do you put here? What do you put there? Um, and I think also you can just, you should rearrange books constantly take them all down and then put them back up in a different way, move stuff around. And it is all about promoting discovery. Bookstores are places in which I believe you do not come in any longer to buy the book you want, I mean, except for you know, if, if, if you're Rebecca Yaros, um, which maybe not many in this room know, but yesterday there were queues around our stores for midnight openings um, uh, for, for, for a, a fantasy uh, speculative fiction book. Uh, that's fun, the drama of doing that in a bookstore. But otherwise, you're coming into a bookstore to find, to browse. And as often, you'll think you may want a book, but you'll walk out with another. And it's the skill with which we do that. Does that apply also to libraries? I would, in my own experience, absolutely. The, the library, my university library, was a place of extraordinary discovery. And I know that my children now talk of their university libraries uh, in the same way, just places in which they spend so much time in which you know, guess what I found, guess what, blah, 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 and, and places in which you do discover. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tamsin Gunneau with ASTM, and my question touches on another form of physical media that I think is very relevant to some of what you've spoken about with ebooks and the fluctuating marketplace around physical books and how there still is a place for them and some folks were dismissive of that and how bookstores could still thrive. Um, specifically, film, Blu-ray, et cetera, uh, is going through a similar situation right now, I would say, because of streaming. We've seen one of the biggest distributors in the US for Blu-ray, a company that was specifically in distribution between businesses, has stopped doing it suddenly this year. Best Buy has announced that they'll no longer carry physical film in stores or even on their website. And since Barnes & Noble is one of the few big chains then that still carries not just very random DVDs the way, say, a Walmart does, 
uh, if you had any thoughts about that segment moving forward since you've already <laughs> clearly experienced that with books. Yeah. Um, very good question. I mean, we in 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 reality, we are uh, Barnes and Noble is a bookseller first and foremost. That's what we are. We lead with books. And books are central to everything um, uh, that we do. But around books, we sell uh, things that we feel live alongside them very satisfactorily and and actually support uh, the enjoyment of coming into a bookstore as well as actually allowing us to sell a few more things. Uh, educational toys and games important. Uh, board games, puzzles, and so on. Um, newsstand magazines is, a, 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 is really important to us. We are the last sort of really true range holding uh, magazine retailer. And then uh, what we call media, uh, and that is music and film. Um, vinyl has been massively successful for us. Um, and that has been by following exactly the same principles as with books. It's about range. Get your range in. We don't. Um, have quite the same difficulties around how we organize that range. But again, there are some, some nuances, uh, but it's about range. Um, and to be honest, I was sort of, when I came here, because this is new to me, um, 2019, uh, scratching my head as to whether CDs and, and DVDs, Blu-ray, had much of a future. The, the sales line is just horrific. Um, but actually, it, it turns out that if you concentrate in exactly the same way on range uh, and you have them all there and you properly present them and you respect them, uh, your sales go up. Um, it's certainly true of movies, which I have. I, 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 it, it, it seems astonishing, actually, that, that people still have the means to play them, but they do. Uh, and our sales are going up. Even more bizarre and completely incomprehensible to me, but it's happening and it's absolutely true. CDs as well, who knew? People collect CDs. If you have a really good range of CDs, people buy them. Uh, so no, we're looking really uh, positively at our media and we're having though now to invest significantly in changing how we present them. Um, so if you go into any of our news stores, you will see that, um, particularly the bigger news stores, uh, I think we've got that really done well. Um, it's, there, there are really good uh, and solid presentations of, of all three of, of the formats that we carry, um, and we're feeling very good about it. Our concern is, uh, is, is around the, uh, the, the distribution channels and, and the partners that we re rely on. Um, very, very solid throughout books. Um, publishers are doing fine. Uh, less true in the world of, of magazines, newsstand, and uh, media. No, that's really great to hear. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Uh, I'm Josh McDonald. I'm from the George Washington University, um, and my first career was as a bookseller, so it's always fun to hear, hear from you. Um, we've been speaking a lot about organization, and one of the tensions that uh, libraries ha are having right now is, I think, sort of similar to yours, which is we're talking a lot about de-skilling and reskilling and compensation and professionalization. Um, and I wonder how much you can talk about um, your relations with labor negoci negotiation at your stores and just with kind of unionization, professionalization of your staff. Um, it, it is um, the, the, the first thing that we rely on is our people. Um, and it is precisely that sort of re-professionalization of it and how you support that in terms of the structures you put in place, um, which in our case we do um, predominantly by no longer uh, celebrating the primacy, the sole primacy of the store manager. Um, we think that that um, is, is to place too much of a burden on a single individual, particularly if you then uh, use that, as has traditionally been done, as an excuse to um, not have proper pay and progression under them. You just have retail workers underneath them being paid the minimum wage. We're now putting all of our stores into clusters, four or five stores, and trying to uh, identify individuals with the talent to hold each of the particular skills that we require to, to run a good bookstore. And there are there's operational skills, but there's commercial skills. There's skills around use and media, um, presentation, social media, and it goes on, on through. Uh, so we're trying to now develop those skills, have clear accountability for the individuals who have responsibility for developing those. 
which in turn allows us to pay those people much better uh, and drive much more professional training. Um, one of the um, difficult aspects as you um, try and run much, much better uh, bookstores uh, based around identifiable skill sets is that you have to have some element of performance management. Um, if you're training people, you can't just sort of train them and say, great, you're trained. You actually have to determine whether that training landed. Um, and uh, if, if you've never had a culture of performance <coughs> management, uh, that that's produces tensions. Uh, if you're changing also how people work, um, you will get a lot of pushback, and we do get a lot of pushback. Um, the recategorization, you know, back to that little earlier example, the recategorization of history uh, to be chronological was deeply unpopular um, and was subject to uh, petitions um, to go back to, to having it alphabetized. Um, we do have a small amount of union um, activity at the moment with us. We've got four or five stores that are uh, that are petitioning to unionize. That creates for us an interesting dynamic uh, because you know up till now it's been about how do we organize ourselves and, and engage with our book selling teams, um, uh, convince them that moving to a, a structure with much more uh, uh, much more fluid promotional lines, much quicker promotions, but but more demands upon them. Uh, now has a sort of there's a there's a third party in the relationship, and, and we're all, we're all working trying to work out how that one goes. Um, but at least we are all um, very much aligned in that. Uh, we all agree that pay matters, and we all want to drive that on. Uh, we all agree that having clearer promotional structures um, is good. Um, we all agree that having far more full-time people as opposed to part-time uh, is essential. Uh, Barnes & Noble that I came into, um, as was Waterstones, was 20% full-time, 80% uh, part-time. Uh, Waterstones today is 80% full-time, 20% part-time. Uh, the journey from one to the other is 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 quite complicated, um, and it's it's a very very positive one for for those who prosper within it. Uh, it's a quite difficult one um, for for some who who do not. Uh, we set standards, and that that's tricky. Um, so I, I would say this: it's very much a work in progress. For me, it's about uh, really appealing to the vocational element here. Um, because as we march down this route, we are saying we are becoming professional booksellers. And in all honesty, that isn't what we've been in the past. Uh, we were not running good bookstores, and we were not running good bookstores because we didn't allow our people to be good enough. Um, uh, but it takes time, it takes a lot of investment in training, um, and a lot of investment in paying. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for the questions and the insight. Hi, my name response. is John. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just saying. Sorry, uh, we have time for one quick question. Thank you so much. My name is John Dove, and like many of you, I'm, it's hard to categorize exactly who I am. But I've been to Charleston for since 2004, and I'm looking forward to maybe 10 or 15 more of them. And I just wanted to share a couple of things I learned right to the, some of the points that you raised, which is one is a, a fellow who's a historian of books told me about a book written by a famous uh, philosopher engineering, Petrosky at Duke University. And it's called The Book on the Bookshelf. And it's the whole history of bookshelves. But it has an appendix of 26 different ways to organize your books. And when you read it, you realize none of them work, really. So you might be wanting to do it by size because it fits the shelf, or you want to be, there's one bookstore in suburban uh, Boston that's actually a really lousy way to organize books. It's books by publisher, and they just, it's really easy to load the new books when the book, when they get delivered, but it's really horrible to try to browse for. But in any case, uh, that's, that may be very interesting to people. Book on the bookshelf. And the other is, I'm describing about having the electronic ways. There's been a number of things that have been presentations done here at Charleston where vendors have had ways of, well, here's what your books look like in Dewey. Here's what they look like in Library of Congress. And you just click a button and it'll show the both ways. So you're electronically browsing both of those. And like everything else, those systems are all de defective one way or another. But there's one in particular that was really, was presented here at Charleston several years ago, the library thing. And library thing, you can, if you can organize and catalog all of your own books 
And then you can organize them by color, by weight, by all the metadata that other people may have put in to the, to, to, about those books. You can ask, boy, are there anybody else has in their library these two weird books that were really nice of mine and maybe they some have some other weird book. So anyway, just th thanks for this presentation. It's really, really good. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you all for this morning and just remember they're going to be putting the walls up for the Neapolitan so beware <laughs> while you're walking around thank you